Our final speaker for today is Ben Sparks, who obtained his PhD from the Australian National University. In 2020, Ben joined the Defence Science and Technology Group as a quantum technology researcher, where he is working on projects ranging from quantum assured position navigation and timing solutions through to uh, extremely sensitive magnetometers. Thanks, David. Great. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the conference organizers, in particular Vincent Daria for organizing these, uh, these innovation sessions. It's really fantastic to be at this conference this year and um, really learn a lot and hope to be back here in a couple of years for the next one. Um, so as David said, my name is Ben Sparks. I'm a quantum technology researcher with the Quantum Technology Group at the Defense Science Technology Group. And we work across a vast range of quantum technologies from sensing to timing and also to communication. And this project on quantum secure time transfer fits really nicely between those last two. So before I actually um, start talking about why quantum time transfer could provide some benefits for, for PNT in general, I just want to discuss why we'd want to build our own time transfer network or process at all. And here I define time transfer as really being any way of synchronizing two clocks at two different locations. Now, come as no surprise that uh, precise timing is crucial for defense applications. So just one example is that obviously defense have assets that move very, very quickly over very, very long distances and has to be very, very precise in where they end up. And so timing is critical to that. So for instance, for munitions, if we have a timing error of a few nanoseconds, we can miss a target by a meter or so. So that's sort of the level of precision that we need at, at the very least. Um, and at the moment, we get our both timing and synchronization information from the Global Positioning System, or GPS. And like many countries in the world, we use this for applications ranging from navigation to coordination and to communications. Now, GPS precision or accuracy, I think for civilian applications of the order 15 nanoseconds or so and getting better for actual military applications. But I guess in the spirit of this conference, you know, can we challenge ourselves? Could we do better? Could we get a better timing signal for better um, location accuracy or faster comms rates? And the answer actually is yes. Um, we have the key ingredient of that already, which is better clocks. So without going into much detail, the clocks that we have on our GPS satellites, um, microwave atomic clocks, while state-of-the-art currently is optical atomic clocks. And these operate many orders of magnitude better than the microwave counterparts. Unfortunately, they're also at much lower technology readiness levels and much larger size, weight, and power requirements are needed. So these can take up entire labs and require many people to operate them at any point in time, which is not particularly useful. This is why Australia um, is investing money into ruggedizing and compactifying these atomic clocks, and CDS mentioned this yesterday, and that we are taking not one but two different optical atomic clocks to the, um, the, new, the Rim of the Pacific naval exercises off the coast of Hawaii in a couple of months. And we built those in collaboration with our university partner, which is really exciting. Uh, it's not just us who are trying to ruggedize these optical atomic clocks. In fact, DARPA put out a call for proposals for optical atomic clocks just, I think, late last year or early this year. And what they're hoping to achieve is, in two years, develop a clock that would lose one picosecond of time over a thousand seconds of operation. So it's one part in 10 to the 16, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they want to then put that, that clock onto a fighter jet of some description and fly it around and make sure that would work. So that's very exciting work there. It's only one part of the solution, though. So we need really good clocks. We need a, a good way of transmitting that signal from that clock to other locations in the field. And maybe you can't read it there, but the second dot point in this, this DARPA slide is they want, along with their great clocks, a really precise way of time transfer. And they're asking here for sub-picosecond methods of time transfer. We should be very impressive if we can achieve that. So that's one reason we want our own time transfer system, so to get better precision than GPS. And the other main reason for it is effectively resilience, again, the whole point of this conference. So we've heard, I think, talked a lot about this morning about the fact that GPS could be spoofed or jammed, so we could lose our, our, our um, we could lose GPS altogether, or we have someone spoof our location to be somewhere else. This is just one example, probably a well-known example, of someone spoofing a GPS signal from a boat that was somewhere in the Black Sea to an airport in Russia on and off. And while this is a really obvious spoofing, so the, the ship would obviously know it wasn't actually at an airport, um, in general you can make this quite subtle. And in fact, the, I think the Bond movie, Tomorrow Never Dies, is based entirely on this premise that you could you know, spoof a signal a little bit and cause a lot of trouble. Um, it's not just you know, nefarious media barons who, or, or high-tech militaries who can spoof signals or jam signals. In fact, I could buy a, a jamming device off the internet for $50 at the moment, or I can make my own spoofing device for about $225 using a Raspberry Pi and a software-defined radio. Um, and people use this quite commonly, 
um, for such nefarious applications as spoofing their phone location to catch rare Pokemon in Pokemon Go. So it's much more prevalent than, than you may think. And so we need a, a more resilient solution, especially for this spoofing area, ideally for jamming as well. And this is what leads me to the idea of quantum time transfer, which can offer both these solutions. So better precision than GPS, and also an unspoofable signal. So how did this work? Well, we start with creating pairs, what we call correlated photons. So we, we start with a very, very strong laser, in our case at 400 nanometers, so in the blue regime. We put that into a special sort of crystal, we call a nonlinear crystal, and then very, very rarely, so I think one out of a, a million of these the photons, so the individual particles that make up this, this laser beam, these photons will go in and it will split into two. These two photons that will come out will have half the energy, so energy is conserved, uh, and double the wavelength, so it'll be 800 nanometers, so just in the infrared. And there are two key properties of these photons that we really care about for time transfer. The first is they're created effectively instantaneously, or exactly the same time. And by that, sorry, I really don't have a mouse. But um, effectively, on, on that graph on the right there, this is looking effectively the time of arrival of these two photons at two different detectors as they vary some function of the system. And what you can see is that the line itself is really, really narrow. And that narrowness is of the order of 100 femtoseconds, so sub-picosecond timing for these signals is def definitely possible, and that's really exciting. The other cool thing about these two photons we're creating is we know their polarizations really well, or they've got a very strong relationship between the two polarizations, so it's just how the photons oscillate as they move through space. And that is really important because we can actually take these two photons and we can quantumly entangle them. So this is what Einstein calls spooky action at distance. He really, really hated it, but it turns out that he'll tested this many, many times and it's definitely, definitely true. Um, and this can provide us with the unspoofable nature for a quantum time transfer system. Effectively, what we can do is we can entangle these photons in a way that both photons are both, say, say horizontally and vertically polarized at the same time, but the opposite photons, so we call them signal and the idler, so say the signal is horizontally or vertically polarized, the idler is vertically or horizontally polarized. But if we were to measure them, we'd cause both photons to instantaneously collapse into one of those two states, and we know the relationship between the two. So it sounds a bit far-fetched, but it's definitely true. And what we can do is we can use this to guarantee the authenticity of the signal, because if we can send these two photons to two different people, they can measure if they're entangled or not. And if they're entangled, we know they must be coming from our trusted source in the middle. So there's no way someone could spoof that signal. So that's sort of the, the basic idea behind it, but how we go about doing it in practice? Well, this is our, our very, I guess, preliminary idea of our ultimate goal for this work, which is a sovereign distributed timing network. And I was really pleased at this morning's session, and I quote that um, AVM Roberts said that assured PNT solutions may not just be in space. And that's exactly what we've sort of decided on here, that this solution would probably involve <coughs> command bases and forward operating bases running ideally really, really good clocks, or just really good clocks. And then we'd have optical links to, say, CubeSats or UAVs and drones to send that timing signal around a network, and then eventually you probably need some microwave signal to get that timing to the, the warfighter in the field. Now this may seem pretty far-fetched, but my goal in the next couple of slides will show you that actually it's not, so um, I'll show you an idea of a command to a CubeSat link, and also sort of drone-to-drone -drone distribution of entanglement. Um, and I was really pleased in the previous session in, in this lecture theater, we heard a lot of talks about um, between UNSW, ADFA, and DST developing satellites that could actually send at least optical comm signals between them, and ideally maybe one day quantum comm signals between them. That's, that's the, tying up another part of that network diagram there. So we are sort of pushing towards actually demonstrating these bits all individually. And so just, just two of these experiments that have been, I guess, demonstrated over the last few years. So in 2020, the China Mishis quantum satellite, which has been around for a few years now, demonstrated the ability to send a quantum time transfer signal from a satellite to a ground station in China. Um, and this is with 80 dB of loss along that, that chain. So a lot of people think quantum mechanics can't work without loss, or with loss, but here we've got a signal working with a whole lot of loss going on. And that little graph at the bottom that you maybe can't see very well is actually the time transfer signal they got. So um, the relationship how many photons you get correlated or driving together as a function of time. And what we're looking at is sort of the variation in that peak at the very top there. And that's steering around for them at about a 30 picosecond rate. So they've got 30 picosecond timing resolution with this signal they've already achieved. But they haven't synchronized a clock with it, and that is very important. The other, I guess, bit of work that's really relevant to this is an, another work from China from a group at Nanjing University in 2021 where they managed to send um, entangled photons via drones to two different ground stations. So in that picture that, again, maybe you can or can't see, depending on your eyesight, um, so drone one there is creating streams of entangled photons. It's sending one of those streams down to one ground station called Alice, 
and the second stream is going to that second drone, drone two, and that drone is actually just redirecting the light beam from being sort of horizontal to pointing it down to Bob at ground station number two. So what happens then, Alice and Bob can then check their signals classically and determine if they're entangled or not. And again, if they're entangled, they can guarantee the authenticity of these, these timing signals they're receiving. But again, they haven't actually synchronized any clocks with this. And that leads to our work. So in 2021, we were funded for a year to look at quantum time transfer and see in what environments it could work and how well it could work in those environments. And this work uh, culminated in an experiment we did at the dark tunnel at DST Edinburgh, which is a 50 meter long sewerage pipe uh, housed under a whole lot of dirt. And what we took there, we took an off the shelf correlated photon source. So not entangled, but correlated. So the time and position should be there. And we measured one stream of those photons immediately out of the box to get a timing signal there. And the other photon stream we sent up and back down this tunnel to make a 100 meter folded free space loop and then measured the photons arriving back at this end. This is effectively the timing signal that we achieved. So basically relative time on the x-axis and number of counts on the y. And again, we're looking at sort of that peak, where that peak is and how much it jitters around. And we looked at this as a function of things like adding loss to the system. So we controllably added a whole lot of loss into our system. And we could see um, signals quite a long while there. We also add a whole lot of noise to the system. So we shone a torch at a detector as well to look at what happens when we add loss in. Um, and just very quickly, to summarize the results, we could see signals up to 37 dB worth of loss being added in, which is not quite 8 dB, but pretty good. Um, we could also see signals up to 240 times the background counts compared to signal counts from our detector. And again, that's a really promising sign. Um, and we achieved time and precision in both cases between 50 picoseconds at the better end to 150 at that, the, the not quite so good end. But again, really exciting preliminary results. And just very quickly, what we're going to try and do next is our first next step is to go from this sort of off the shelf commercial correlated photon source to building our own entangled photon source to guarantee um, the authenticity of the signal. And that's currently being built um, by DST personnel, but at Adelaide University. Um, and then we're going to take these, these quantum signals and actually synchronize two clocks together. So we're the first ever to synchronize two clocks together. And our real advantage here is working with an industry partner, Quantex Labs, who built what they call the most precise clock in the world. So a really great test bed and it's risk mitigation uh, process to go through and actually synchronize these clocks together before moving to much smaller clocks that can be deployed onto drones, so these CSAC clocks. And that would be guess, a really big step towards achieving this sort of quantum time distribution network that is our ultimate goal. And with that, I'll skip the conclusions, but just very quickly wanted to acknowledge the full team of people who worked on this project. So this is not just a DST project. We've been working with Adelaide University and industry partner Quantex Labs. Um, this has all been possible through a Defence Innovation Partnerships Collaborative Research Training Fund grant, and for that, we're, we're very appreciative. Um, thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. When you get to down to very, very small time accuracies you're talking about, when do relativistic effects start to pop in? And that is a most excellent question. So we are talking to someone at DST who's an expert in relativistic physics, and I think it's more complicated than even I thought it was. So we're not actually going to get to that stage in the next few years, but it's something we're really worried about, and we want to uh, get the experts in on that to help us figure out what's going on. So just by going quantum, we don't get rid of relativistic effects. <laughs> that's, that's your question. Thank you. Uh, second question, um, is it correct that the photons have a, one of two polarizations? The, it, the it depends exactly on how you do it, but yes, yes. So why can't a, a spoofer flood it with those two polarizations, knowing that one of them will, will get in and perhaps disrupt, be a spoofing type signal? I don't know if that's a valid question, but... Well, you definitely can jam the, the detector. So that's, that's definitely one thing you could do. So if you flood it with light of any description, that, that could make the system invalid. But if you're doing optical length, that's much harder to do than a, a microwave length. Um, but in terms of just giving it a false information, it, so when you, when you measure these, these photons to measure entanglement, you actually measure the polarization in a whole lot of different bases, we call different angles. And then the quantum mechanical property of superposition comes in. So when you measure it in a different measurement basis, it changes how the photon actually interacts or what detection you get from that. And you actually compare these numbers you get from this together and you end up with this, this thing called the S parameter. If this number is greater than two and less than two root two, then you know the signals must be entangled and must be quantum mechanically linked. If it's less than two, then it could just be a whole lot of loss or noise, or it could be someone trying to jam your system. So there's this one number you can get out from this, this pretty easily that will tell you whether it's truly entangled or it's not. Yeah, Vince? Yeah, is there a difference in the propagation between the signal and the 
In what sense? In terms of wavelength difference between... Uh, so they can be. So I, we spend a lot of time at the moment with our, our, our homemade source trying to make sure they're exactly the same wavelength. So if they have to be entangled, you can't have anything that you can tell, 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 tell them apart. So if one was a different wavelength than the other one, then you could know which one is which and therefore we'd lose our entanglement from the way we're trying to do it. So just by changing the laser wavelength, the pump laser wavelength a little bit and the crystal temperature a little bit, you can actually match these up really, really nicely. And that's what we're trying to do.